And I'm also going to put this live on Facebook. So just give us a minute to get that set up. So this will be recorded tonight, so you can watch it later on on Facebook Live or YouTube. And we're just going to start that broadcast. We have to wait until after the music stops, I guess, because copyright or something. I don't know if anyone else has had that happen. Okay, we should be live in just a moment. And Natalie will probably check that for us. Great. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Here's our agenda for the tonight. We're really excited for everyone to be here. My name is Alex Shore. I'm the executive director of Catalyze SV. Natalie, if we could go to the next slide, that'd be great. So we wanna thank particularly Kate Hidalgo. You can see her doing American Sign Language interpretation right now. So if anyone needs that, feel free to take advantage and go to Kate's screen and you can bring it up big if you'd like. We especially wanna thank our co-presenters for tonight, the African American Community Service Agency, the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors and the Latina Coalition of Silicon Valley. We have a couple representatives from those organizations if they wanna wave and say their name on camera and say hello real quick. Do you wanna go with Gabby? Hi everyone, Gabby Chavez Lopez, president of Latina Coalition. Thanks Alex for having us. We're really excited about the discussion. And Tim, would you like to Say hi. Yes, good evening everybody. Tim Bobian with the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors. Really excited for the, the conversation tonight. This is gonna be a great event. Thanks. And I don't think we have anyone from the African American Community Service Agency, but if they're here and they wanna say hello, we'd welcome them. Okay. I wanna give a thanks to Catalyze SV's communications coordinator, Nally Tarbox, who's playing the beats and helping with the questions and the slides. Natalie, say hey. Hey everyone, I'm Natalie. And as I mentioned, we're recording this for you all to watch later if you'd like and follow along. Facebook Live and YouTube, anyone watching on Facebook Live, welcome, thanks for checking us out. So we do have a growing audience on here and we would love it if we could keep folks muted. And if you can put your time, uh, I mean, if you could put your questions into the chat function, that will be how we'll be able to track folks' questions. We'll have time for a few questions tonight, not too many. We've got some already that we thought you might be interested in that our moderator will be asking about. So we'll see, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can of yours, and we'll intermingle your questions with the moderator's questions. So if you can stay muted, uh, unless you're asking a question or a follow-up, but it's always best to put those in the chat function because there's just so many people on screen at once. And we're gonna try to stay on track and with the agenda, you know, tonight is about equity in the field of real estate development and these, women of color leaders who work in real estate development, sharing a bit about their experiences and also their perspective on equity. So we'll probably, if there are other topics that come up, we might suggest other ways to get in touch with the panelists at the end of the presentation uh, or in touch with Catalyze SV. 
Next slide. So just a little bit about our organization. We're a nonprofit community group. Here's who we're funded by. And this is our mission statement. We want to build a community in which everyone feels welcome. We want to work to improve the community engagement process so that we can get better development and more housing in our community. And there's ways you can engage with our organization. We have two committees that do a lot of our work, our community engagement committee and our project advocacy committee. Our community engagement committee works on making the public engagement process around development more inclusive and collaborative. And we also have a project advocacy committee that advocates for specific developments and to make them as equitable, sustainable and vibrant as possible. And you can also sign up for our newsletter here. If you're looking for an even quicker way to engage, Natalie can tell you more. So Catalyze SV has several social media sites and like Alex said, the best way to stay in the loop with all that we do and just to you know about the Silicon Valley's development is to follow Catalyze SV on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. We post um, articles and blog posts about what's going on um, in the Silicon Valley and you'll stay up to date on all of our events. We think that bios are really important and we want to give you the opportunity to read them uh, but reading them ourselves can get a little, we want to put the focus on the conversation tonight between the panelists. So we do want to introduce them. They've got very impressive backgrounds and experience, and we want to highlight that. And so we put it up on the screen. You're welcome to take a look in, uh, afterwards. And certainly, since they're such prestigious ladies, some of these are online as well. We also want to give a very special welcome to Marisol Verdugo, who last night became a board member of Catalyze SV. So congratulations, Marisol. Thank you. She's going to be moderating our discussion and taking us from here. She'll, she and I will be trying to take your questions through the chat function. And I'll be jumping in if needed. But otherwise, Marisol, take it away. Great, can everybody hear me okay? Do you guys have, do I have sound? Do I have, do I have sound? Yep. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, just a, a quick uh, bio of myself, my own background. Um, I got my master's in urban and regional planning from San Jose State and worked a number of years as a project manager in affordable housing development with South County Housing. Uh, until I transitioned to the tech sector uh, with the 2008 recession. And although I no longer work in nonprofit or in development, um, I stayed community active and found my way to CSV through Alex. Um, and as he mentioned earlier, I just accepted a position on the board, uh, which is great. It allows me to stay uh, connected to my first love of development and housing. Um, so this is a great opportunity for me as well. Um, our panelists here, uh, just a quick intro for each panelist. We have uh, uh, Candace Gonzalez, who is a Chief Housing Officer and Managing Director of Sand Hill Property Company. Thank you, Candace, for joining us. Uh, and then we have Regina Celestine, uh, the Director of Housing Development of First Community Housing. Thank you for joining us. And Macy Luong is Housing Development Project Manager of Allied Housing. So thank you ladies for being here tonight. Really appreciate that. Um, shall we just jump into the first question? I thought we would take the first couple of minutes uh, for each panelist to kind of do a brief um, background um, about themselves and what encouraged you or motivated you to pursue a career in real estate development. Um, Candice, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Thank you, Marisol, and thank you, Alex. I'm happy to be here. Um, I, I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again. I'm, a, I'm a proud of the story. I'm a first generation immigrant from the Philippines, moved here when I was four or five, lived in the East Bay, was a beneficiary of affordable housing, subsidized housing. So I firsthand understand what housing instability means, but also what housing stability can do for a family. So my sisters, my sisters and I all went to college, I went to Berkeley, they went to law school, UCLA. Um, after that, I was a tax attorney for a couple of years, 
and then real estate law for 10 years. And then I found my calling when I joined um, Palo Alto Housing Corporation, an affordable housing developer as the CEO. It was an opportunity to start building affordable housing in a high resource community. So I was with Palo Alto Housing for about 10 years before joining the Sand Hill Property Company team about two years ago um, to build more housing, including mixed income housing. Um, and the reason um, briefly that I got into housing is because we can talk about this later, but I think all things wrong in the world stem from housing inequality, which obviously stems from all of the racism you can think of, institutional systemic racism. So um, I think it's our duty to really try to fix that and, and make reparations in any way possible. Thank you very much. Um, Regina, would you like to take the, the second position? Sure. Thank you, Marisol and Alex. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, yeah, let me, I guess for me, it really starts uh, with undergrad. I was a student at Stanford University and um, I was there for engineering, but I decided to participate in a, a social justice um, lab in the social psychology department, I think a lot more about um, the world we live in, racism, inequality. And so I stumbled upon a course, actually, uh, that was in the civil engineering department on the design and development of affordable housing. And it was through visiting nonprofits doing affordable housing in the Bay Area that I realized that I myself had grown up in affordable housing. And my family, um, many members of my family have been beneficiary of uh, subsidized housing. And when I realized that, then I knew that this was the field I had to be involved in because I was just so impressed with the fact that there were folks out there doing the work of thinking of um, individuals like myself, children growing up in low-income low households, and folks like my, my single working mom um, and trying to make the world a better place and her quality of life for her and her children better. And so once I realized that there were people who dedicated their careers to doing that, that's what I knew I had to do. So I've been in this field for quite some time, um, just working towards improving the quality of life of uh, disenfranchised, uh, communities, low-income communities, those who have suffered from the, the structural racism that we know exists in this country. And um, I've done not only affordable housing development, but community and economic development as well. But affordable housing development is by far the most rewarding because when you give someone the keys and see them move into their new homes, it's just um, an overwhelming sense of satisfaction. So. Um, that's, that's me and that's my story. Great, thank you, that's a great story. Um, Macy, would you like to provide your uh, brief background and how you uh, found your way into this real estate industry? Sure, um, my name is Macy and thank you for having me. Thank you Marisol for your introduction. Um, I think my interest in housing started when I immigrated from Hong Kong when I was young and coming to California, seeing the contrast between a high urban density environment and a very more sprawl suburban environment compared to Hong Kong and the income inequality that results in both situations. Um, so I kind of go back and comparing how I grew up versus how I'm living now with my family as well. And I think um, I started my career in architecture. So I did my undergrad in economics and went to architecture school and I practiced originally in Chicago um, doing uh, institutional buildings, so courthouses, school. But um, I became interested in the real estate aspect when I went to grad school, um, learning real estate development and finance specifically in housing and realizing there are multiple different aspects beyond just architectural design. And there are also ways that you can work directly with the community instead of just through design itself. And so after grad school, I decided to pursue um, other aspects to learn what that is beyond design. So I did um, land use economics, work as an economist, 
and also uh, went into affordable housing finance when I was at Bridge Housing. And that solidified my love and interest through the mentorship I had at Bridge and um, the folks I work with in what we can do to collaboratively utilize all of our skill set to help the community. And I haven't left since, and I, I love every second of it. That is great, thank you. Um, our second question is, uh, in each of the panelists, in each of your opinions, why does diversity, equity, and inclusion matter in real estate? Uh, Candice, would you like to start us off again? Sure. Um, I, I think right now, um, gender disparities and, and racial disparities are so clear, and I think um, it's, it's not maximizing what we can all do as a community. Um, different points of views, different um, diverse people come up with different plans, different solutions. And I think we all have different goals in mind. So um, you, you need that diversity to achieve the different goals. You know, there's, there's um, corporate real estate, there's housing, market rate housing development, there's affordable housing, um, there's, uh, there's just different aspects. And I think it's best achieved by a variety of different people. And when it comes to women, I think we can, we have emotional connections to something. So for example, when it comes to development or um, you know, building homes, I, I think we would have a strong point of view of what's needed or what's critical. Um, and, and if we're trying to keep it real, actually um, studies have shown that um, when there's a, a, a diverse workforce, your rate of return um, your ROI goes up significantly. So it's also maximizes profit by having gender diversity, um, if, if that's the goal. But uh, I think we just need different people to connect to different parts of what we're trying to do uh, and come up with a solution together. There's no way that one person or one type of person could really achieve all of our goals when it comes to um, the kind of solutions we need in this world. So I, I think the global perspective, the different perspectives, is critical. Thank you. Um, Regina, would you like to um, answer next? Sure. Yeah, there, there's so many challenges. You know, I've, from the time that we think about the impact that real estate has on communities and neighborhoods, you know, we're talking about an impact that lasts 50 plus years on a community. It, it really shapes that neighborhood when you when you place that housing or that building or with that community facility on that corner in that street and um, there's a real need to connect to the existing community the existing residents and understand what the needs of the community is it, are um, how the how we can leverage the investment that we're looking to bring to that neighborhood to benefit the people who are already there and living there. And I have experienced, you know, um, we, we talk about NIMBYs and, you know, the challenges that we have when we go into a community and we're building housing or developing real estate. And there are communities where we go into knowing that um, folks are, are disenfranchised, don't have as much of a voice. Um, and there are times when, as a developer, we don't want our, our vision for that community to be challenged. So we're fearful of interacting with the actual community. And I think that diversity, equity, and inclusion, that framework uh, of including different voices will really shape how a lot of those conversations go. Um, how we enter various communities in terms of, and uh, how the, the community itself, you know, experiences the developer coming in and sort of um, dictating what's going to be built in their neighborhood and how their neighborhood will look uh, moving on. I think that there's a lot of work that can be go be done around those conversations and the diversity in those rooms where those conversations happen. Um, I, I also think it's important when we think about, you know, what we're building to have a variety of perspectives because of who we imagine living there and, and the variety of perspectives of, you know, 
if you're um, going to have, you know, a lot of larger units, what, what is it like to live in a family, to take care of a family? Different perspectives really allow you to build housing uh, for different, different groups. And I think that there's a challenge when we're designing a building of being able to experience, you know, an entryway, um, common areas from various perspectives, if you don't have those perspectives in the room from the designers, the architects, the contractors, the developers, the engineers, if there's not diversity, um, it's, and it's just, you know, white men essentially deciding how people are going to live in their homes, I think it, it becomes increasingly problematic. And so there's just so much work that we can do in this industry to, to help shape our neighborhoods and communities to reflect everyone who lives in our neighborhoods and communities. That was beautiful, thank you. I completely agree with Regina that centering those community voices are so critical when it comes to real estate development. Um, and it, it really has to be an intentional process of centering the community voices and making sure everyone's heard. So thank you, Regina, for saying that. That was great. Um, Macy, would you like to um, weigh in on this uh, topic? Well, sure. I agree with uh, both Candace and Regina. I think, um, I think everyone deserves the opportunity to participate in the upside for opportunities and housing in general. So, and what we have to do is, you know, we have to reflect the diverse community that we're in. And I feel like being trained as an architect way back when and now using some of those design skill set, we're not creating homes just to create a house or homes for people, but for affordable housing, we're creating spaces that overcomes class and race and the biases um, that we have in housing, especially when it comes to affordable housing. So that's what I think about. And I also feel like in community groups that I've been engaged in, um, both presenting or participating or listening to folks, um, the communities are so diverse in different regions and to have a diverse and inclusive um, professional um, being involved in a process or also perspective is important to reflect the diversity that it actually um, is in our community and, and the regions that we're um, servicing. And, um, and since I serve, uh, you know, both on development fronts, uh, doing project management and on the design review board, I, I compare the neighborhoods in Richmond versus Napa versus South Bay and then East Bay. Um, the folks are very different and people's concerns are always very different in terms of their perspective and it reflects their background. So I think having a diverse perspective and inclusive perspective will, will be more effective for us um, and more empathetic in the work that we do and how we serve our community in general. Great, thank you. Um, any other comments on this topic from the panelists? You know, I, I do want to add that I think it's great that we're starting to have these conversations in, in light of recent events like George Floyd's murder and things like that. Um, it, I think it really just stresses how important diversity and inclusion is in the real estate field. If the, these conversations happen and they were happening 40, 50 years ago, if there were more people um, a diverse group in real estate development back then, maybe some of the practices would have been pushed back on a little bit. Some of the, you know, blockbusting, red lighting, some of this re residential segregation, um, there could have been, you know, stronger voice allowed. Trust me, all of the color, all of the fight into the room for decades. So, um, I, I think a lot of things would have changed if diversity and equity inclusion was at the forefront decades ago, but it hasn't, we're, we're, we're so delayed. Um, and only now we're we starting to, um, to really experience what that means and what um, all the negative consequences from not having that um, in the last few decades. So I, I'm glad the conversation's happening now. And, and I think that I like what both Macy and Candace point out about our obligation in this field to um, really Build, build projects and developments that overcome the systems that are in place and, and all of the challenges 
especially as affordable housing developers that our residents face, um, carrying that obligation and looking at a, a new framework, something that's much more restorative and something that does give back to the community and doesn't just extract. I think that those types of conversations are starting to happen and will have been happening, but are starting to be more mainstream. And it is our obligation to think about how we've been doing things and how we can sort of turn it on its head and, and change the framework so that it works better for our residents. That's actually a great uh, segue into the first uh, audience question. So Regina, we'll, if you don't mind, we can start with you. Uh, the question is, when you envision developing the ideal living situation for those earning close to minimum wage, what do you envision and what do you think is realistic and why? That's great. So for us at First Community Housing, and um, I, I deeply believe in this philosophy. When we think about the average worker, the person who is working hard um, to meet their, their financial responsibilities and maybe making minimum wage, we think about housing that is located in the cent center of the city, um, central to services, to access to transit, um, central to amenities, parks and schools and all of that because we understand that you know when your when your budget is limited you may have to choose between you know housing and paying your rent and car expenses and transit expenses and and other things like that so you should be close to grocery stores so locating the housing somewhere that's um, close to the existing infrastructure is very important. Uh, so that's what we think of first and foremost. So we build urban infill housing. That's very important. The other thing we think about is sustainability in terms of, you know, um, is, this, is this housing that we're building, this home durable? You know, is it, is it high quality? Is it going to provide fresh air, you know, ventilation? Um, is very important to us. And so we think about sustainability in terms of durability, in terms of, you know, folks maybe spending more time in that housing and, and what's, it, what's their experience going to be in terms of um, no VOCs, no toxic uh, things being released from the walls and the floors. And so we prioritize that. Um, and then we think about the common area spaces. How are they going to use it depending on what type of population this is? If it's a family building, is, the, are there, is there a community room and access to the internet? We do Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi throughout our buildings because we know people have to be able to apply for jobs online and their children may have to, you know, um, engage in school and education online. And we think of the outdoor spaces as well. Um, depending on the type of unit. But those are the, the first and foremost things, is the location, the quality of the building, and the experience of the tenant, and then the common areas. Great, and it sounds like then uh, all of that is being done through your organization today, correct? That's right, yes. And I think we, you know, in order to take it one step further, we have to really look at data and we've actually started to do that, to think about, okay, if we have computer labs, who, who in our buildings using them the most? You know, do they need to be? Um, we are doing digital literacy training. So, okay, maybe people aren't used to um, going on the internet and they need training around using the internet and other apps and things like that. So we do training around that, um, but we are looking at data to understand better uh, in terms of racial demographics, who uses our services, who uses our, uses our free transit passes that we give to all of our residents so that we can better understand how that dynamic um, racially affects the, what we do and if we can rethink some of it. That is awesome. Um, Candice or, or Macy, did you want to add uh, to this question as well? Um, I think um, Regina did an excellent job answering that <laughs> goals when it comes to building affordable housing. 
Um, just to add a little bit, um, I definitely have focused, I think I said this earlier, in high resource neighborhoods, whether it's Palo Alto or Cupertino. And I think a lot of it has to do with the negative consequences, again, of re residential segregation. And I think the opportunities provided in these higher resource neighborhoods, you know, the, the, the good schools, the excellent schools, the health care, um, all of those things that I think uh, would benefit some of the lower income households and fam families and then bringing them to these neighborhoods and then helping them um, hel helping them adjust to the neighborhood, right? So oftentimes you might build low income housing in Palo Alto and you get kind of culture shock that there's no diversity here. And so how, how do we best serve our residents so that they are successful with our programming, whether it's the after school programming or English as a second language or some literacy, literacy and financial literacy classes um, all of those things to help support um, and access the resources that are in the neighborhood. So I, I think it's really important. And I think it's really important for these communities to share their resources. So, um, at, at, you know, I've, you know, we've been fighting, I've been fighting that battle for a long time because I think um, there really is um, some exclusionary policies out there. And um, I think it's time that that stops. So. All right. Thank you. Um, both Regina and Candice, um, you know, I, I think, you know, because primarily I do uh, permanent supportive housing for the lowest income individuals, and we always have integrated service from abode services in all of our properties. Um, you know, the holistic approach of services plus design is really important through the development process. And um, what I also found that in the design aspect or development aspect uh, with you know, one aspect is design is um, it's important to ensure that we're not designing for affordable housing development where it characterizes itself as something different than a housing type or looks different. Um, I've come across projects that, you know, with, uh, without an understanding of affordable housing, for instance, it, folks think that it has to look different or in New York, I remember there was an article saying affordable housing project has a separate door entry um, compared to market rate. Those are the things that we want to um, avoid, not to segregate folks um, of different income levels or in a neighborhood, but to integrate everyone both within and without the product itself. Thank you, Macy, that's great. Um, yeah, that was a really good discussion. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are getting a lot of really good audience questions. Uh, I have one um, that was uh, uh, pre-set up. Uh, I'm gonna ask this one, spend a little bit of time here and then we're gonna get jump right back into some audience questions. But because this is a women's forum, women of color forum, uh, we didn't want to leave out uh, a very woman issue, which is caregiving. Uh, in many cases, that's being a mother. Um, and how have uh, those that are uh, on the panel that are mothers or caregivers, how have you, um, what are your biggest challenges and how have you balanced uh, both of those responsibilities with your professional careers? Candice, would you like to, to kick that one off? Sure. Um, how do I say this gently, but there is no balance. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and it, I hesitate to say that because honestly, women should be able to have kids work flexibly, and we can still work efficiently and manage productively. I, I, and I, I truly believe that. But I haven't been a good example of that, and partly because I think of what's gone on. You know, uh, women in real estate, it's been a climb to get to wherever we are, um, and it's hard to pause or put on the brakes at all, or else you feel like you'll get left back. So as a personal example, I have three kids, a nine, seven, and six-year-old. My seven-year-old has special needs. I had three of them. I had three, three and under. I really never took a mater maternity leave. I was showing up at city council meetings when I had a one-week-old or a two-week-old um, and had to work throughout. And some of that was probably self-imposed, but I felt like I worked so hard my whole life to get to wherever I was in that point in time that taking a break would set me back and I would never be able to catch up with a male dominated industry, industry ever again. So um, there really isn't a balance. I mean, luckily I love what I do and I'm passionate about the mission in any job that I'm in, I wouldn't take if I was not passionate. 
but it, it's hard to have a balance and I'm lucky I can do it because I have a village um, helping me at home. That is, uh, as a very true realistic answer. Thank you for being so um, open. Um, Re Regina or Macy, did you want to, to chime in on this topic? Yeah, I, one thing I would say is that, you know, I had to, definitely when I had my two daughters, I had to prioritize the work in a different way and prioritize um, the, the children in a different way. Um, one thing that I did when coming back from maternity leave was ask for at least one day remote. And um, I'm grateful that the place I was working at agreed to that. But I was also um, a little bit later after I had had my first daughter um, interviewing for another position where I asked for the same flexibility of one remote work day and they said no. And so I had to not take that job. Um, so th that's what I've discovered is that there's certain things that I've needed in order to be uh, good at work. And, and I feel like um, now that we're all in you know, place and we, we, we learn what we need a little bit more intensely. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think for me, I had I did have to understand at least that I needed at least one day of flexibility. And I'm happy to say that my employer now gives me that. Um, the other thing is that, yeah, there were some meetings that were af at an after work hours. And I recognized that I was not being invited to, you know, dinner after work or with the investor or the, or the lender because I had just had a child and there was an, an assumption that I wouldn't be available. And so um, I think that's a conversation that I have to have with my colleagues that at least give me the chance to say that I'm unavailable so that I can know that the meeting is happening instead of you know, having the, 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 the up close personal time with an investor or someone that I'm gonna be working with um, without me. So there's, those are a couple of examples of what I've experienced in the challenges. That is uh, great. I, I, I love that, uh, the, the two different diverse uh, experiences. Uh, uh, any other comments from our panelists? Thank you. Um, all right, we have an audience question. Um, let's see, it says, uh, when minorities are purposely being left out of the process of development, how would you, in your respective field, course correct? Uh, example is uh, BIPOC, low income renters being let, uh, left out uh, when conducting community feedback. Macy, would you like to kick this one off? Uh, sure. Um... So I, my experience had been uh, in all of the projects I've worked on, um, both from the project management's perspective and the city's, to be very inclusive in our uh, community and who we outreach to, who we speak with. We try to include, you know, high level executive to policy maker, to business leaders, to residence leader, to local community members who just want to show up to homeless individuals who like to uh, show up on all, every single one of our community meeting, for instance, and we're very welcoming of that. If we find that uh, folks are being left out, uh, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, we would invite them usually in our next meeting or have a separate one-on-one um, -on -one or in a group setting that we make sure we hear their concern or support or any opinions that they want to, to share with us. Um, and to take into consideration their perspective. So we want to make sure that our process is inclusive in all aspects. Um, and that's what I try to do professionally and personally as well. Great, thank you. Um, Candice, Regina, did you want to? Um, yeah, um, add to um, Macy, um, 
She's exactly right that when you notice that you have to be, be very purposeful and intentional and adjust your outreach. Um, we have a lot of properties in East Palo Alto and a couple of projects going on there. We did a survey recently and found out that most of our tenants, maybe 40% of our tenants don't have access to Wi-Fi. So we've had to adjust because we want to make sure that they're showing up to our community meetings. So um, it's whether it's going door to door or um, you know, not emailing, just notices, uh, sending out hard copies, uh, mailing, you know, doing noticing any which way possible. Uh, so you definitely have to adjust if you truly want those voices heard. Um, and I, I'm hoping that people truly want different voices heard. So it's, it's, it's adjusting. This is, this is something that I have prioritized um, improving at first community housing, because I do believe that, you know, when we go into a, a new neighborhood and we get, um, you know, we take the lay of the land, we get maybe a list of stakeholders from either a neighborhood association or from an elected official that the stakeholders or the, or at least the leadership of those, um, in those neighborhood groups can be less diverse and be, you know, prim primarily white. And so um, I think we do have to search out additional voices and stakeholders on a regular basis um, so that we can have a better representation of the neighborhood. Because, you know, sometimes the people who are more involved, um, who are, you know, more vocal in a community may not fully represent that community. And that's definitely something that we've learned and it, de it depends on the community that you're in, but that's something that we are working to be cognizant of that and to um, intentionally, you know, reach out to other institutions that you may not be typically given, oh, you know, talk to this business owner. Um, so we're working on that. That's definitely something that's a work in progress. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, we touched on this one a bit earlier in the conversation, but this one will be a more focused time uh, to talk about it. Um, this is a white male dominated field, especially at the executive level. What are some challenges and your opinions on systematic change you would like to share? Who would like to go first? Regina, would you like to take that one first? I'm still collecting my thoughts on that one. No say. worries. Uh, <laughs> Candace, would you like to uh, step in the ring first? Sure. Um, well, I think it's, it's not a secret that the real estate industry, especially commercial real estate, has been a male-dominated industry. Um, I think there's been some progress and you're seeing more and more women enter the field and not just in marketing or property management or asset management. They're actually getting into development and commercial brokerage as well. So I think you are seeing some diversity there that's slow. Um, you know, in the upper ranks, definitely it's still, I think, something like 70% male once you hit the, you know, the VP or the C level. Um, so that obviously has to change, but, um, you know, we have to be again, intentional of making those changes. You know, we have to start being intentional when it comes to recruiting women um, and recruiting um, people of color in general. Um, we have to have a pipeline of women. We have to have training and mentoring in place, um, you know, across the sector, we just have to make those intentional improvements. So, um, you know, I, I think, Diversity will be helpful for everyone. So it's, it's just changing um, the, the old boys club. <laughs> old boys club. <laughs> Macy, would you like to uh, comment? Um, sure. Um, I agree with Candace. I think um, it's important to have a diverse group uh, of executives on the top level. So um, one, more junior staff and students and look into the profession and see there are some representation of their race or, or their gender, et cetera. Um, I mean, I personally find my experience in a company where the woman was the CEO, majority women, 
was amazing because it was very um, collaborative, effective, and uh, I highly respected the, the leader of the firm in affordable housing development. And I think I also remember um, briefly for about a year or two, I, I served as a mentor to a fresh grad from my old graduate school who had an engineering background entering into commercial real estate development in New York at a large corporate firm that's majority, mainly white men. And so I help her navigate some of the challenges where she felt it's an old boys club and you know, folks would go out to have lunch together and, um, and, and what that is like. So I think if we're more intentional, like Candace was saying of, um, you know, bringing younger folks or mentoring folks or understanding that the executive level needs to be more inclusive, it can be a very effective and productive uh, solution to reflect the diverse workforce that we are and the women and women in color that um, that can be recognized and should be recognized. So. Thank you. Buttons, sorry. Okay. Regina, would you like us to wrap back to you? Yes, yes. So um, <laughs> thank you so much. I, I just have so many thoughts on this because I've been in the room and so many times when, as the only woman, woman of color, um, and that dynamic is just, it's one of power. I feel like in the real estate industry, and I don't, I, you know, I don't know other industries, but I've, on, I've only worked for nonprofits. But in the real estate industry, and even in the nonprofit sector, there's a lot of um, leveraging power. And we know that a lot of that power comes from systemic racism, you know, who owns land, property, um, who, who gets to decide who is eligible for a loan, who gets to decide who has access to the funds that it takes to do this sort of scale of development. And, um, and so, yes, the, it, a lot of it is problematic, um, you know, there, there's a lot of assumptions about who the expert is. You know, I've been in the room as the expert and, you know, um, advocating for a community-based developer. And, and, and there's a lot of questioning about if people have the credentials to be trying to do the things that they're doing, if they, if they have the experience, if, if they should be, you know, um, supported in whatever their endeavors are on behalf of the community. And all of this, you know, you can see the color of it all in the room play out and who, ex who um, sets themselves up, establishes themselves as the expert and, and gets to decide whether or not um, the community has a say or a representative of the community has a say in what, what development takes place. Um, I've also seen a lot of decisions be made around real estate development um, over lunch in one-on-one -on -one meetings that exclude the whole team um, over, you know, uh, small one-on-one -on -one intimate meetings where everyone isn't represented um, who will be impacted and who on paper should be involved. There's a, there's a lot of, and, and especially in affordable housing, which is interesting, there's a lot of, you know, um, looking at well, ex experience and um, balance sheets. And when we know that historically underrepresented communities um, don't have balance sheets or may just be starting out or may not have property and, and things like that to leverage. And so there's a lot of stat maintaining status quo or either, um, you know, uh, part partnering intentionally creating partnerships between um, nonprofit, religious 
institutions, cultural institutions and experts, which are typically, you know, um, wider and more male and saying, well, you need them because you don't have the expertise or, or you don't have the financial backing. There is a lot of that. Um, now, you know, I could probably do a whole panel just on why that is in our industry and how everything is set up. But, you know, there, it definitely exists and it's something that we all have to talk more about, be more aware of and challenge. And, oh, and that's the last point I'll make is that when I am um, the only woman, woman of color, person of color voice in the room, what I've noticed is that um, when you speak up, it feels like your perspective, your voice is different because I can I can never be in a room and not be a black woman, right? Like that's who what 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 people see when I'm in the room. And so when I speak and I say something, it's it's very noticeable that my perspective is different. And so I have to be willing to back it up double time, triple time, because it's not going to sound like, you know, everyone else who's, and the, and how the conversation is going, it's going to feel like something that's pivoting the conversation or changing the, the dynamic every time I say anything. Uh, so I definitely noticed that. So, you know, um, there's a lot of work to be done around what Candace and Macy mentioned, but I just wanted to speak a little bit about the challenges that I've noticed. That was great. Thank you for sharing uh, all of that. Uh, all three uh, comments were, were really, really well done. Um, anything else? This was a big, uh, a big one. So any other lasting comments from our panelists? All right, um, let's take an audience question. Um, what are some exclusionary policies that you would want to target first? Anybody want to take this one? Candice, how do you feel about taking this one? <laughs> I think um, the, biggest, <laughs> the biggest exclusionary policy we have are zoning laws, <laughs> our land use and zoning regulations. And that's the biggie. That's what's leading to not enough housing being built in many, many communities. So oftentimes all of the development standards, the outdated zoning codes is really meant to exclude what people consider newcomers or new development or those people. So I think that that's the biggest tool we need to um, tackle. And, and luckily, um, you know, some, some state law stepping in um, that takes away some of the local control when local control is not getting it done. It doesn't happen without a fight, but um, it is a fight towards those exclusionary policies. So um, that's a whole topic in, in and of itself. So I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you. Yeah, zoning, that's a good one. Um, Macy? Um, yes, I, I agree with Candace, and I can relate <clears throat> when I, I remember when I was working as a land use economist, I had to work on general plans, specific plan updates um, for the city and counties, and oftentimes the way that we characterize certain land uses and zoning is based on the revenue that it generates to the city. And so historically, you know, market rate housing makes more money affordable doesn't for the city. So what I would love to see is having more um, affordable housing in market rate neighborhoods, even if it's designated market rate. So there can be some sort of um, income averaging overall rather than just luxury market rate housing. Uh, that would be something that's ideal. Great, thank you. Um, Regina? I don't think I have more to add than, than Can Candace and Macy on this one. Um, okay. Um, can I right. actually ahead, add that um, one of the things that's, um, that's exclusionary, we should all have just willingness for neighborhoods to, to include people and to want to diversify and want to share resources. So you know, the, the whole NIMBY movement, you know, we're counteracting it with the YIMBY movement when it comes to housing. But um, how do we really change the messaging and 
and get people to change their mindset. And I know it's really, really hard. People don't like change. I get it. You know, the, the people that have been living here for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years and benefiting from Prop 13, they don't want to change. But how, how do we um, sort of change that mindset so that people can be more inclusionary and welcoming and open, um, you know, with, without the fear that all change is bad? So. Um, because that that no change mindset is exclusionary in and of itself. So, thank you. That's great. Uh, any any last comments, mm -hmm. more panelists? Okay, there's another audience one that was really good. Um, how have you uh, identified or cultivated mentors and sponsors in your life? What has that meant to, for you? I think I can go first because I am probably the most junior <laughs> among our parents. <laughs> but I, I find um, my professional career had been heavily influenced by wonderful mentors, women, women of color, and um, their leadership and experience and judgment and deliberate nurturing of my professional career had been instrumental in, in where I am today, honestly. And I, I credit them and I still keep in touch with them. Um, and I try to do that with folks who are younger than me <laughs> and, and less experienced than me, where um, particular students who are um, architects who want to go into development or housing development, I find that I can share with them my transition and career into affordable housing from architecture. That's something that uh, they can relate to because there's always a challenge where if you come from a design background, there's finance, numbers, performer, what does that mean? What does that mean with policy and how that translate into real estate? And so I find that mentoring is um, critical personally. And I do this with my uh, current um, university that I graduate from and also at ULI. And I, um, and I just asked to be on the mentorship program for NPH, so I'll be a mentor for people of color. And so I think I'm being paired up with a architect um, who wants to be in affordable housing. So I find both receiving mentorship and giving it's critical in our profession. And I appreciate all of my mentors. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and great to hear that you're uh, uh, giving back to the next generation, that's great. Um, Candice or Regina, would you also like to comment here on the um, mentors and sponsors that have helped you along the way? Yes, what I've found is peer mentors is a really uh, wonderful source of encouragement. Um, you know, having peers that are within and external to my organization that I can uh, feel comfortable to talk to them about you know, the challenges that I might be feeling, uh, especially, especially around this season of my career, I was feeling a lot of challenges around that sort of, um, I guess, glass ceiling. And I started talking to friends and colleagues about that feeling of just, you know, what is this? Why, did, why does it feel harder to uh, reach the next level of um, this work and of leadership in this work. And what I found was that a lot of, a lot of these ladies of color had similar experiences. And so, we, and so then I became intentional about bringing it up to people who, you know, they don't even have to be in the real estate field, just in, in, in the work, in the field, um, of life just at this stage, what they were experiencing as women of color. And we had a lot in common. And so um, that's what I found is peer mentorship has been very rewarding for me because also, you know, at, like Macy was saying, there's, there's receiving, but there's also giving. And there's a lot of uh, newfound respect and friendship and closeness that comes from sharing stories and being very, you know, um, how do you say, like uh, trying to build on those stories, not just 
not just to vent, but to really seek out counsel from our peers. So um, I definitely recommend if folks, you know, don't have someone who is, they see as a mentor to seek out others who are, are their peers for that same type of relationship. Um, I can agree with um, Regina. I'm on, I think, four or five different boards, and I'm fascinated by kind of the informal mentorship you get just by being on those boards by wide, wide network. I'm always learning something new and hearing different voices, and it's always really pretty fascinating, I think. And, you know, there's someone in every area that, or industry you can think of in Silicon Valley and some of these boards, and um, it's, it's really um, fascinating. As far as having a formal like mentor program or men mentee, I don't, I feel like I have a handful of informal mentees. Um, I do a lot of panels and other engagements. And um, when, when people reach out afterwards, I have to say that I do tend to discriminate in that I do tend to respond to some of the women, um, women that reach out because um, I feel that when it comes to their career in real estate, um, so I, I feel like I'm sometimes more open-minded when it's a woman trying to come up in real estate that wants to talk or have a coffee or just wants to learn more. So um, part of the reason I think I do some of these panels. It is great to hear uh, everybody is very active in um, giving back to the next generation. And it actually leads right into our next standard question, which was on uh, current mentorships and internship programs. Um, that our panelists may be aware of that we could um, promote uh, on this on this uh, uh, evening's panel. Um, Regina, I know when we spoke before this, uh, you had one uh, very specific one to um, um, yes. promote. <laughs> yes, uh, we have been super excited and me personally, I've been very involved in uh, MPH, the nonprofit housing Association of Northern California, they have a Bay Area housing internship program. It's referred to as Bay Hip. And they started it about three years ago. We're on the third Bay Hip intern here at First Community Housing. We love it. The intention of the program is to um, recruit people of color, young people of color who are in their undergraduate degrees. So young people of color, um, folks who may be first generation college students, for folks who may be bilingual or multilingual into the field of affordable housing. And I think it was very, um, you know, it, it was very smart for MPH to see that we needed to go to the young people and get them interested in affordable housing. So before they went on and got their master's degrees and really got set on a certain path in terms of their career to introduce them to the field so that they could be more interested, ask more questions, be exposed. And specifically, the internship is designed to expose them to the field of development, which, um, which is more um, white, more male, and uh, has less diversity in that segment of affordable housing. And so it's been wonderful. All three of our interns have been um, very enthusiastic about getting introduced into the field and we need them. We, we need more people in affordable housing development, especially people of color for all the reasons that we're talking about, but there just isn't a pipeline of people um, and, and, you know, if you're in the field, you know that it's, it's definitely a challenge to build capacity and hire onto your team. And so to know that we're contributing to building a future pipeline of project managers and development directors is, it's wonderful to be a part of. Great. And the link to this internship was just posted in the chat. So anybody who got inspired by that, please click the link, save it pass it on, apply. Um, That's great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Macy, did you have a program that you would like to promote tonight? I agree with Regina's uh, BAHIP program with NPH. I think they also have a new mentorship program. Um, I 
I'm involved with their Emerging Leaders Peer Network, which is a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program where we put up workshops to learn from each other really around the same professional level as well as to other folks who are interested. Um, I know ULI also has a mentorship program on a yearly basis, but that's a uh, housing, affordable housing market rate, uh, different types. It depends on the mentors who they're available. So they also have resource. And I think NAOP, um, the commercial women real estate also has a like young leaders program as well. I'm not involved with that, but I heard about that. Great, thank you. And I, just, I just wanted to add that um, I did participate in the ULI mentorship program as well as a mentee, and it was a wonderful experience. I agree, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Ken, did you have anything that you would like to add to that list? This is a no, great list. No, no um, I participated in the NPH program too, three years ago at Palo Alto Housing, and Palo Alto Housing has continued uh, participating in that program, so it's a great program. Great, great feedback. Um, thank you. Let's see. Um, that was a really good discussion. We have another audience question. Uh, how do the panelists think that the community engagement process can have a material impact on developments, more inclusive neighborhoods, and developing, excuse me, on developing more inclusive neighborhoods? Candice, would you like to uh, take that one first? Sure. I, I think if we had different voices in the room, it might take others that are in the room trying to oppose the project or oppose the development. It might give them pause to kind of rethink um, the opposition or opposing the project or saying something like, oh, those people or low-income people are uneducated. I've, I've heard all of that. So I, I think if you center the voices, those voices, you know, help those voices speak up, um, it'll definitely give a, a wider range of voices in the room. It could really, I think, push projects in the right direction. And honestly, just keep people honest and have them um, kind of check what they're saying and, and what they're thinking um, and have that kind of healthy debate of what's appropriate, what works, what makes sense here. And why does it not make sense? You know, I, I've had projects where it's low-income senior housing. Oh, you're going to sneak in your low-income grandchildren into our schools. But maybe if some of those families and seniors and lower-income households were there in the room, if we could get them to participate, I think we could counter some of that negative conversation. Um, and, and actually, and then also show them opportunities where um, there's so many successful stories when it comes to women, people of color, show them what that looks like and what that kind of inclusive community can do um, to a person um, and, and help kind of break some of those achievement or opportunity gaps. Um, so I, I think that's really important. I, I said earlier that everything wrong in the world is caused by in housing inequality. You know, it's, it's caused, um, you know, wealth and income gaps, it's cost opportunity gaps, it's cost healthcare, unequal access to healthcare, it's cost mass incarceration of black Americans. So um, I'm not sure, I think I'm going on a tangent, but um, I, I think including more people could sort of counteract a lot of that. Great. Um, Regina or Macy, would you like to follow on to, with that one? Yes, I, I agree with Candice um, more. It, it is all about how we view each other. And if we can see um, more commonality than difference. And if we, you know, if we just see each, each other's humanity and understand that, um, that it's not not really a zero sum game. It's not the more I have, the less you have. Um, that if we, if we both participate, if both of our voices are heard, um, then we have a better, then we both benefit. And there's more, it, more inclusivity means more benefit for all of us. It doesn't mean that, that there's any loss from your end. And I think that 
that is the challenge that we're in. That is what we face in this country. And we, right now, we're in this moment where we can see it clear as day. Um, and I'm referring to, you know, the pandemic. And we can go on and on about that. Um, but just seeing that, you know, we, we, can, we can do things with the, the benefit of our neighbor in mind and make decisions with the benefit of our neighbor in mind, knowing that we, that we don't actually lose anything than to just see them um, like us. So that that's, yeah, I, I could go on a tangent too, so I will stop there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very well put, and you're right, it's a big topic and we could probably finish the whole night on that one. Uh, Macy, did you, did you want to contribute as well? I, I agree with Regina and Candace. I mean, I think um, understanding uh, and, and, sharing perspective, both the local constituents and, um, and, and from the project team side, it's important having some sort of consensus building dialogues um, throughout the whole process. I think everyone's viewpoint will be different because we're all individuals and communities are also very different in different areas. So I think dialoguing and discussing from the beginning is important, whether it takes the form of, you know, face-to-face, -face, phone, anything, um, and, and try to understand how um, the other folks think and share your perspective. I think it's, it's never a um, perfect solution and perfect process, but, um, and there are always going to be communities who oppose or who feels certain ways about affordable housing or any type of development. And so the consensus building um, should start from the beginning and continue throughout the process. And, and I think that's important. Um, excellent point. And it actually takes us right into another audience question. So um, thank you, Macy. Um, the next one we have is, what are some misconceptions about affordable housing that we as advocates can help correct and fight the negative narrative? I'm going to wrap back around to the start. Candice, did you want to start us off? Sure. There, there's so many, so many misconceptions. Um, some of it includes, oh, affordable housing is, is low quality. It's going to look like a slum. It's, it's poorly maintained. You can just tour all of our affordable housing properties, and they're all so high quality. Regina mentioned earlier all the sustainability and green features we add to it. Uh, all of the management and maintenance requirements, um, you know, the annual inspections or multiple inspections, in the end, they actually look way better than a lot of market rate properties because of that. So I think that's one huge misconception. Another one is, oh, um, you know, affordable housing, the people there don't work. Not true. A lot of um, their essential workforce, there are essential workers right now. So um, that's a mis misconception too, or, you know, it's, it's going to raise crime and lower property values. All, all false, false, false. So enough data to show out there that that does not happen in high quality, well-maintained, well-managed properties. So I think those are some of the biggest misconceptions out there. And um, what can we do to correct that and change that negative narrative? Um, if you have you know, opinions I, I, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think some of it is um, touring people and showing them what affordable housing looks like, what, what it really looks like. You know, I, I did that a few times and said, oh, here's an affordable housing property and here's a market rate or here's here are two properties. Which one's affordable and which one's market rate? And oftentimes people got it wrong when I was doing the tours here in Palo Alto. So it immediately killed that um, mis misconception, uh, misperception. So I, I think it's um, having the conversations having um, just educating people and having the one on one conversations, I think, makes a difference to correct a lot of that um, and, and meeting people and showing them, well, this is the face of affordable housing. This is your teacher, your teacher's aide, this is your caregiver. Um, this is who lives in affordable housing. Um, why would you not want them in your community? That was great, thank you. Um, Regina, did you want to um, add to that one? You um, spoke a lot about the affordable housing development that your um, organization is, um, is developing. Yes, 
so uh, recently we've started providing more affordable housing, permanent supportive housing for those who are um, experiencing homelessness or chronically homeless. And the biggest misconception about that population that we ran into time and time again was that they weren't already living in that community, that there was going to be that once we built the housing, it would attract people from outside of the neighborhood or there would be people who were brought in um, through the county process from other parts of the county um, into that neighborhood. And so that was something that we, we really had to explain how we're all, unfortunately, um, likely to see our neighbors who are unhoused and that they are most likely already in this neighborhood or this community. Um, you know, maybe we can't always see them, you know, in the, in the light of day, but it's what we had to go to was the data that showed that, you know, whatever city we were working in developing the housing, that folks who are homeless, who receive homeless services, um, they, they say that they're from this community, from this city, from this county. They're not coming from other states or other parts of the Bay Area. And, um, and that was something that started to resonate with people when they realized that, yes, I do see, um, that there are unhoused people living in my neighborhood, in my community, and it will benefit me as well if they are housed, if they have housing. Uh, so that was, that was something that we had to understand that that was a fear that people had and, and we had to bring data and uh, educate them on the fact that folks are already our neighbors who live in affordable housing but we're giving them stability. And it, when it comes to permanent supportive housing, we're providing them with services on site. And so we're elevating their quality of life. And um, it's going to be an improvement for everyone, including the neighbors. That is great. That leads us um, to our final uh, question. And I think that's a great segue. Um, it's our final one, so it's the, the close of the night, but it is our uh, call to action. How can people advocate for more women and diversity within the real estate development industry? Um, Macy, would you like to start this one? Um, sure, I mean, I, I think I mentioned earlier, I, uh, I strongly believe in mentorship and um, working collaboratively with peers and um, having mentorship program, informal, formal, I think more deliberate intention and decision making of being inclusive um, in the profession is important, whether it's formally or informally with colleagues and peers where we, we are aware of um, the existing condition of societal structure or income inequality and being more deliberate in when we speak or approach or making decisions or actions to be inclusive and to elevate women or women of color or folks who are um, otherwise lack resources to advance in, in anything um, and to provide more equal opportunity, not just housing, but just opportunities in general. So I think the intention, the deliberations of, um, of what we're doing is, is key in addition to formal, more structured men mentorship. And I think another thing would be our representation of who we are as individuals, women, certain, I'm being Asian American and um, speaking with other Asian women about, you know, their interest in our profession, if, if they're interested or um, if they're immigrants from other countries like me, what, how, how to break into this profession or what course they take, uh, things like that. So being active and also deliberate in, in how we approach would be important. Thank you. Um, Regina, would you like to go next? And, and really quick, uh, she also just posted a link uh, for a fellowship. So anybody interested in that, please go to the chat section 
click that link. Um, thank you very much for, for posting that for everybody. Um, would, you, uh, would you like to um, comment on our call of action for uh, more women and more diversity, Regina? Yes, I agree with what Macy said about elevating uh, the women of color that you know and their voices and their perspectives. I think um, in some spaces, you do have to just ask the question, open, open up the space um, in a way that more women and women of color know that they can speak up. Um, I think they're, and, and that their voice is welcome. I think that there's a lot of work to be done around um, diversity in leadership. And, you know, a lot of barriers are created, barriers don't, that don't exist for other segments of the population are created for women of color when they're trying to, um, you know, elevate in, in leadership. And I think giving them that platform giving them that, that promotion, that opportunity is really important. And just knowing, knowing that diversity is valuable and equity is valuable and, and saying it time and time again, because you, you, you recognize the, the truth of it. And also just creating spaces that are welcoming. I think that we do lose people of color, um, women, minorities, because they had negative experiences in the workplace. And so we have to be very conscious of making sure that we have a workplace environment that is supportive. And, you know, that goes back to that question about how we balance being mothers and, and work. We, we need more employers and supervisors to think about how you're taking care of, you know, and creating an environment that takes care of um, mothers and fathers and, you know, and people who may have different experiences and have different needs and, and ask, you know, is this, is this environment supportive? and try to see how that can be answered from different perspectives, but also ask your staff. It's, people would, would be surprised um, that their actual work environment could be felt as negative or hostile. But if you ask, maybe anonymously, then you can get a more uh, truthful answer. So, but there's, there's just so much work to be done. But I think, you know, creating those spaces um, taking different approaches to what we see as supportive and, and, and not just um, being focused on the business of it all, but, but being focused on the people that um, you employ and the staff, that, that, that is helpful. Thank you very much. Candice, did yeah, Macy and Regina basically said it all. I think it's very, it's being very deliberate in hiring. So in the recruiting and the hiring practices and then being deliberate when it comes to retention policies and practices. So having the mentorships, the training programs in place. And then honestly, really just teaching women or telling women to go for it. Um, go after the jobs they want, go after the, um, the positions they want and have that confidence that they're in the right place and that they do have a voice. Um, and I think that just comes through empowering women and elevating women, as Macy and Regina said. So, you know, just go after it. That is um, awesome words to end by. Thank you, Candace. Mm -hmm. um, that is our last um, question of the evening. Where are we on time? We're a little, looks like we're a little bit early. Good. We're good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, huge, thank you, <laughs> Alex. Huge thank you to our panelists, Regina, Macy, Candice. You were phenomenal. I thoroughly enjoyed every response and answer you provided tonight. Um, thank you, everybody who attended in the audience and provided uh, questions. I hope we got to the bulk of them. Um, thank you, all of you, for uh, sticking with us uh, tonight and through Zoom and these crazy times. Um, and still participating with us. Um, 
Alex, did you have anything else you would like to add? A couple of closing remarks. We wanted to do this panel because equity is crucial in how we develop this community. For me as a white guy and for everyone in our community, it's important that we stand up for equity and what gets developed. Equity is infused throughout Catalyze SV's values. One of our values is an equitable community engagement process. Another is housing solutions for all. And a third is inclusive, diverse communities. And so when we work with real estate developers, we push them to build the most socioeconomically and socially integrated communities possible. And we push cities and developers to, to the points of our panelists tonight to build developments through a community engagement process that encourages all voices to be at the table and to be part of the decision-making process. So we will continue to have these conversations. We welcome you reaching out to us through the slides we shared earlier. We also wanna invite you, uh, if you can, to keep in touch with our panelists if you'd like. Natalie's going to show our slide that offers some contact information for Regina, Macy, Candice, and Marisol. So if you'd like to be in touch with them, she's showing that for us right now. These are ways you can be in touch with these amazing women. And I also want to thank Kate Hildago, our ASL interpreter. I just love watching you interpret. You are so phenomenal and it's so expressive, your face, and I just really enjoy it. So thank you for helping make this evening a little bit more inclusive for our community. So we wanna thank you again. Uh, Natalie, if you wanna jump back to the, how to get involved in Catalyze SV, and these are ways to stay engaged with our work to help get more equitable, sustainable, and vibrant places. And again, we wanna thank our panelists for the work you're doing in your profession to build equity and in our communities to build equitable buildings. So thank you all so much for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your night. And again, this will be on Facebook Live, on our Facebook page and on YouTube if you wanna watch it or use it later. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Good night. Alex. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay, Natalie, thanks.